it is a distinct noise. I mean, it's a noisy car. I want us to make the best better. A lot of grief, man, and a lot of blooming trouble. A bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing, really. It's not as sporty as it actually looks. It was like a jelly mould. They are designed like a house brick. The whole story about Volkswagen really began as the inspiration of one man, and that man was Professor Ferdinand Porsche. This is not the Porsche mainly responsible for the Porsche cars, it's the father. Porsche Senior had been a self-taught engineer, and he was employed by most of the major manufacturers of Germany and Central Europe at the time. Austro Daimler, Daimler Benz in Germany, Skoda in Czechoslovakia. Most of the time, this was to build very sophisticated, expensive and luxurious cars. As the years went by, what Porsche wanted to do more and more was to design a small car for the ordinary people to actually put Europe on wheels. It was a very difficult project to sell to manufacturers. It's not what they wanted to hear, particularly in the 1930s. So Porsche's inspiration might have remained just that, but for one particular person. It's been said that the best way of putting an inspiration into practice, particularly if it's in engineering, is to have a dictator on your side. And in Porsche's case, there was only one candidate for the job. In January 1933, Hitler came to power in Germany. Later that year, at the Berlin Motor Show, he made a speech where he promised all kinds of good things for the German people, including cars for the people, including a network of autobahns. And Porsche realized that perhaps here was the kind of backer that could turn his dream into reality. He actually got in touch with Hitler. The two men met at a hotel in Berlin over afternoon tea to discuss Porsche's ideas for a people's car, and from then on, the two really hit it off. The car we know as the Beetle didn't start off being called that. It didn't even start off being called the Volkswagen. The original name for it was the Kraft durch Freude Wagen, which is Strength Through Joy Wagon. The Nazi Party's um, trade union and leisure organization was the Strength Through Joy organization. It organized everything from workers' holidays to pension schemes to playgrounds to sports facilities and the car fell very definitely into that remit. And when it was decided to build a factory at, um, on part of the estate of a nobleman called Count von der Schulenberg who owned Wolfsburg Castle in Germany, the actual town was not originally to be called Wolfsburg at all. It was to be called Stadt des KDF Wagens, which was the city of the strength through joy cars. Now, this becomes such a cumbersome mouthful, even in German, that um, they looked for a, a shorter, snappier title, and people started to call it the people's car. It was the obvious title, which in German is Volkswagen. The reason the Beetle became such a byword for reliability is that having a dictator backing something means you can get resources that normal car manufacturers at that time could never afford. And once enough prototypes had been built, they were handed over to the German army and the SS to actually test drive them for thousands and thousands of miles. One by one, the inevitable bugs that any new design has were identified, they were traced and they were cured so that when the Beetle was actually ready to be sold to the German public who had been saving stamps on cards to actually buy these cars, the car was as near perfect in terms of reliability as it could be. Sadly, although things seemed to be going so well, time was running out for the Volkswagen and the people who'd been saving up for it. Not one production car emerged from the new factory before war began. The Beetle during the war emerged in a completely different form, an open, slab-sided, jeep-like vehicle, which was the German army's jeep. They called it the Kubelwagen, the bucket wagon. It was a brilliant success as a cheap utility military vehicle. After the war, the Volkswagen plant had been heavily bombed 
Um, only parts of it were still standing. The main priority for the people who worked there was to produce something so that they could earn money to keep alive. Wolfsburg was in the British zone of Germany, and as such, the Volkswagen factory was available as part of the Allied war reparations. And a committee led by Lord Roots came over from the British motor car industry. They were actually offered by the British occupation authorities the chance to buy the Volkswagen Beetle, the factory, and the entire organization for three million pounds. They turned it down. The main thing that turned them off the idea was the design of the Beetle. They said it was hopeless. It had the engine at the wrong end. They didn't like the individuality of it. It was totally different from the kind of cars they produced themselves. To start off with, the Beetle was a funny little car. It was laughed at. People thought it was, it thought it was a, bit, a bit weird and they didn't take it seriously. The Beetle was the first car I ever owned and I learned to drive. I wanted a Beetle desperately and couldn't afford a new one. And so I, I found a good second-hand one and it went from there. And I've now owned probably over 200 Beetles throughout my life. And I'm still buying them. <laughs> I've got Beetles starting at 1952 and running through more or less for every year they made them through 1976. I'm, there's lots of people like me, I'm not the only one. It is a, it's in a very infectious enthusiasm. If I could take the, take the cure, I would save myself an awful lot of money. <laughs> in the 1950s, the Volkswagen, not then of course known as the Beetle, was presented in catalogues using extremely lavish artwork. The cars looked large, the cars looked comfortable, and the convertibles particularly looked like pre-war Mercedes-Benz with their giant hoods and their large fenders. They were presenting this comfortable lifestyle, which rather sinisterly links back to Hitler's original presentation in 1938, where there is a cover of a magazine which shows a family driving a rather bloated-looking Volkswagen, in the background of which is a swastika. The swastika was, needless to say, deleted in 50s literature. <laughs> Designed to be aerodynamically efficient and it was one of the first cars. I mean when the Beetle came out all the other cars were very square and the Beetle was round. It was like a jelly mould and it slipped through the air and it was very economical, very efficient. But it's a very simple engine. It's an air-cooled flat four boxer engine and basically the design has never changed. And the same engine design is used in the Porsche as well and he's still being produced in the 911 Porsche. It's still basically the same engine. It is a distinct noise. I mean, it's a noisy car. I mean, there's no doubt about that. The early ones had very little soundproofing in it, and because it was an air-cooled engine, it's like a motorbike, and it is a noisy engine but that's something you have to put up with. You don't have to worry about it freezing up or boiling over because it is air-cooled and there's plenty of air. You're never short of air, it's, there's plenty out there. In the late 60s, the Beetle had been around for 30 years and couldn't be treated as a serious car. The word Beetle was used as the heading for the brochures for the first time and we start having jokes against itself, slogans like it only changes for the better carried right through to the end of the Beetle. The, the Beetle's biggest problem, as buyers began to get more affluent and more choosy, was its lack of individuality. They all basically looked the same. Where some people could actually customise their Beetles, a lot of people had the money to buy something different and wanted something different. They didn't have the time or resources to do it themselves. It was this market that Volkswagen produced the Carmen Gear Volkswagens to cater for. Well, this is a Carmen Gear. 
It was made in 1959. They started being made in 1955. They finished being made in 74. Well, this is built on a beetle chassis that has been widened by four inches. And uh, if you took the body off, you'd have basically a beetle floor pan, which is a chassis, and uh, the mechanicals would all be a beetle. It's not as sporty as it actually looks. It's a streamlined body, it's very nice, attractive. It moves faster than the beetle because of that. It's lower slung, it's more streamlined. But um, depending on what size engine you've got, working through from a 12, or two sorts of 12, 100, and you have a 13, a 15, a 16, the bigger the engine, the more response you get. The smaller engine, you um, are nervous at hills, you have to change down fairly, fairly soon unless you have a run at them. But it's a very pleasant car to drive, very satisfying. It was designed by Gear in Turin. It was manufactured by Carmen. They were coach builders, and they had a history of doing cars, which were small runs, one-offs maybe, and they were all hand-built, um, which would have meant more time, more labor, more expense. And they did it on behalf of Volkswagen. The car is called a Volkswagen Carmen Gear. Well, I think other cars can be very beautiful, but the only one that really rings bell with me is the Carmen Gear. At Volkswagen, we don't worry about how our car looks. We worry about how it works. So every day for the past 25 years, we've been testing and torturing things like door hinges and boot locks, seats and shock absorbers. No other car has gone through so much for so little. The thing about Porsche's design for the Beetle was that he put most of the strength into the bottom of the car for good sound engineering reasons. That meant that it didn't matter very much what you built on top. It could be something as individual, as luxurious, as beautiful as a Carmen Gear Coupe, or it could be something much more utilitarian. A vehicle that was slab-sided, it was undramatic, it wasn't particularly beautiful, but it was very efficient at what it did. In the 1960s, a very new type of Volkswagen made its appearance that was going to become, in its way, quite as successful as the Beetle. This was the Volkswagen camper van. It looked totally different from the Beetle, but it shared the same engineering heritage. It all happened in the Volkswagen factory in Germany, where the, they wanted to transport the bits and pieces around the factory. And it, the original transporter was just a platform, four wheels and an engine stuck in the back. And then the uh, commercial prospects were obvious, so Volkswagen evidently put it onto the market. And the public liked it, liked driving it, and they sort of popped beds in it and roofs and fridges and sorts of things. The original van had a split windscreen and is known as the Splitty. This is my van, Tango, right? I bought it for 160 quid eight years ago. It was a wreck, an absolute wreck. I drove it around for about four to five years and it got worse. So then I took it all apart, right back down to bare metal, chopped all the rust out all the way around, even underneath, new chassis. A lot of grief, man, and a lot of blooming trouble. A lot of money, a lot of hassle, a lot of aggro, nearly divorced, but it's nice now, eh? You know what I mean? It's worth it because, I don't know, it's just good, good weekends, good for fun, that's what we do. That van over there, that's what they do look like. This is what they should look like. The reason why we all lowered our vans is, it's just a cult thing, started in California 20 odd years ago. Cal look, California look. It's just cool to be loud. It arrived at exactly the right time. The Beetle itself was already popular in America. People were having more and more leisure time 
and they were concerned with getting out and about and making the best use of that leisure. Camping, surfing, touring, all these sort of things called for a vehicle that wouldn't let you down wherever you were. It was a vehicle that was cheap to buy and cheap to run. It was a vehicle that you could pack a lot of people and a lot of kit into to go anywhere you wanted to do virtually anything you liked. It's hardly surprising, given that sort of pedigree, it took off. The next version, uh, which was the 70s, was the bay window. Now, the bay window had different variations, larger engine, a uh, different shaped windscreen, no different interior. It's a Type 2 Devon conversion bay window camper. Um, so I've had it for about five years now. Um, it's original life. It started off as a yellowy colour, but we opted it out for this colour because it's a bit more, you know, upmarket, so it looked better. This is Bob. We call him Bob. Our Bob. They originally was called Bob because he was the big orange bus, but now he's just the big old bus. Yeah, <laughs> we just love him, and our kids love him too. And uh -huh. look, most of their, some of their other friends sort of say, oh, you know, next time you go to the seaside, could we go with you? You know, because they just want to be seen in it now, and it's great fun. You're passing other people on the road with Volkswagens, the, they the always campers. And they so. always acknowledge you. And if you're in trouble, if you have to, you know, stop for some reason, they will always stop and help you. They're really great. It's a great crowd, and it's it's nice to be a part of it. And from there we came up into the 80s, which we know as the Bricky. At the Bricky stage, the engine was changed from air-cooled to water-cooled. You fight with the steering wheel um, because they are designed like a house brick. We had a, we had a bay in the past. Um, we love our Bricky. Our, our Bricky is affectionately known in the family as Heidi um, because she's our happy wanderer. But we love her. She's, she's done so many, many hundreds and thousands of miles with us and she's great. We love the camper van because we can go completely as a totally enclosed environment. We take our little holiday cottage with us, if you like. Um, she has everything from a, a fridge full of food and our bedding and our waterproofs. Um, we can go to any sort of event and we're there. We can meet people. You can make a cup of coffee or you can put a plaster on somebody's knee. It really doesn't matter. You've, you've got a total little home with you. You're utterly self-contained um, and you just sort of have wheels, will travel. It's marvellous. In the beginning, Volkswagen built the Beetle, the original small car. They then built the Golf. It may not have been the first hatchback, but it was the first really successful hatchback. This is the man who put a million on black, and it came up red. If there is a common factor in the whole Volkswagen story, it's been that the company has been very good at what the Germans call Zeitgeist the spirit of the times. By the time you were getting to the individualistic late 70s and early 80s, the Golf was the car to have. It was fast, you could use it for whatever lifestyle you chose to invent for yourself. This is the man who drives a Volkswagen. Everyone must have something in life he can rely on. The Golf GTI was born at Volkswagen because the engineers had developed a standard car into what is now known as a hot hatchback. The GTI is actually a term that was invented by Volkswagen and has now become something that every other manufacturer has wanted to copy. I own a 1983 Mark 1 Golf GTI. Um, I've, it's quite heavily modified, although to the uncultured eye, to the uninitiated, it looks relatively standard and that's just the approach I'm looking for really. I've had installed a, a G60 supercharged engine from a Volkswagen Corrado Coupe. Uh, the brakes are heavily modified, they're up to sort of the R6 Golf spec to help restrain my enthusiasm. Suspension is all uprated and lowered to cope with the extra power and the cornering forces you can generate. The early Golf GTI was marketed rather hesitantly. I don't think they were sure that it was going to be a great success in this country. 
and as a result it appears merely as the top model in the Volkswagen Golf range. And so you look through all the dull L's and lower versions and you find just two pages on the Golf GTI. By the mid-80s, the Golf as a fashion icon, as a statement of having arrived, was so important and the prestige of the Golf GTI was so important that they presented it in completely new catalogues entirely on its own. Not only did the GTI itself become a cult car, the advertising became cult advertising. The whole series of if only everything in life was as reliable as a Volkswagen. It's here today and gone tomorrow But the world goes on the same You find that 1980s by races would have been added on bits to the golf, so it would have been added on body kits, spoilers here. 90s man is taking those kind of things off and even taking off a limited amount of add on trim which Volkswagen put on, like the, the wheel arch liners, uh, rear wipers, badges, etc. So I've gone for a very smooth and clean, uncluttered look, a bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing really approach. My car's a Mark II Golf G60, which is a supercharged. 17-inch uh, wheels and a badgeless front grille, uh, Mark III front lower spoiler, and it's got the Euro look, all debadged and detrimmed. It's more of a custom look, more than anything. I wanted to make the best better, and just just stand out from the crowd and be different. With Mark III Golfs, no, they've been out about four years, but. You won't see another one that's been modified in this way, really. You'll see them all with big wheels and lowering suspension, and that's about it, really. No one's willing to spend uh, serious money, really, to strip it all down and do a new colour and everything. So, but up to now, this is the only one I've seen that's been modified in this way. I'll try to be different, anyway. <laughs> Especially with a colour like this, anyway. <laughs> Polo is less expensive than you think. So you don't need to be either the richest or the strongest man in the world to pick one up. The Polo was launched not long after the Golf as a, a cheaper, simpler variant for people who couldn't afford the various Golf models. And in a sense, it's tended always to be in the shadow of the Golf. It's never looked quite as desirable as the Golf. It's never had quite the performance image of the Golf. But more recently, with the current Polo, it looks as though Volkswagen are having a rethink. It looks much more like the Golf. It's much more attractively styled. It's got much more modern appeal. It could well be that the Volkswagen Polo is going to carry the, the story that began with the Beetle through to the next decades. All car manufacturers like to think their badges are instantly recognisable, but most of them, I suspect, would concede that the VW icon has always been one of the most recognisable and most potent graphic symbols 